that it reads your rights. Um, it's just a technical thing, just want to make sure we're you know, dotting all our I's and crossing all our T's here, okay? All right, so I said that, uh, you have the right to remain silent. Anything you say or do can and will be held against you in the law. You have the right to speak to an attorney. If you cannot afford an attorney, one will be appointed for you. Do you understand each of these rights that they have been read to you? Yes. Um, uh, do you believe in any of this supernatural stuff? I mean, it says here, I think there's a note saying that you really aren't really uh, kind of sort of nonplussed about the whole thing. No, I mean, no, I don't believe in all this stuff. Talk to me. Your best recollection. What, what happened? I, I can't exactly remember what happened. The, the last moment that I recall um, was, I believe, in the in the, the master bedroom. We were all going back and forth, and uh, and uh, Grant was the one who wanted to go call the police, and I remember we were all kind of going back and forth about that, and yeah, the next thing I remember is just hearing uh, Escobar or somebody scream from the living room. You don't recall a thing. You're saying there's just bits and pieces, just images and stuff. You don't recall specifically what happened at all. No. What's leading up to that? Yes. Uh, no, I don't. Honestly, sir. You're telling me you don't remember anything either? Are you trying to say that you're going to join the rest of this gang of, of, of this group, this circle of people that they're claiming they don't remember anything leading up to the event that happened? Yes. Yes, I'm going to say that. I'm covered in blood. I mean, obviously, something tragic happened. If you will look at all the material that is on oh, this table, you we'll will understand that this, this home, this home is responsible for the actions that you see here on this on this videotape. Well, this whole investigation was incredibly stressful. All right, from the moment we got in that house, stuff was happening, okay? And I think that that just kind of got the better of a lot of us. In 1924, developer Arthur Groves purchased and subdivided the Coston Ostrich Farm located between South Orange Grove and Glencoe Drive. In 1932, lot number 633 was acquired by a Chicago merchant, Nelson Herring, with the intent of building a home on the site for his ailing mother, Belle. Through Sears Roebuck, Mr. Herring ordered a prefabricated, two-story craftsman-style bungalow constructed on the site. However, before his mother could take possession of the home, she passed away. Stricken by the loss, Herring shuttered his business and vacated his Chicago residence, leaving no forwarding address. It was not until weeks later that his decomposing corpse was discovered dead from a self-inflicted gunshot wound. In May 1950, the home was purchased by a cultist, Margaret Kellner. Miss Kellner regularly hosted Gnostic masses at the residence, as well as pagan rites and ritual orgies. During the period in which Ms. Kellner lived in the house, an infamous series of missing persons incidents occurred involving young African-American boys in northwest Altadena. The sole break in the case occurred on August 5, 1956, when a maroon 1939 Hudson sedan was witnessed speeding away from the location from which one of the victims was allegedly abducted. Two days later, a Pasadena police officer stopped a car matching the description. A search of the vehicle yielded a coil of rope, a shovel, and two bags of saltwater taffy. The vehicle's registered owner, Ardell Lewis, 48, a full-time handyman, was taken into custody for questioning. Reports indicate that Mr. Lewis was cooperative and provided alibis for each of the periods in question, all of which were later confirmed by his employer, Margaret Kellner. Though Mr. Lewis remained a person of interest, no charges were filed. Five days later, on August 12th, Lewis was killed by a hit-and-run driver as he was crossing Lincoln Boulevard in Pasadena. It should be noted that there were no further reports of missing children subsequent to the death of Mr. Lewis and his employer's abrupt departure. The house stood vacant until June 12, 1966, when it was purchased at auction by Arthur Blaylock, a building inspector for the city of Glendale, his wife, Dorothea, and their daughter, Elizabeth Marie. On February 19, 1977, Elizabeth, then 13 years old, was the victim of an accidental drowning while taking a bath. According to the police report, this occurred in the master bathroom. 
within days of the tragedy, paranormal phenomena began occurring. Despite her Protestant upbringing, Mrs. Blaylock sought the assistance of a local Catholic priest, Father Henry Sloan. Father Sloan visited the house and, after witnessing several incidents of paranormal activity, referred Mrs. Blaylock to the Stanford Research Institute for further assistance. On March 18, 1985, Dr. Jeremy Johnson, the assistant director of the Institute, accompanied by Elizabeth Escobar, a young teenaged medium, attempted to perform a preliminary assessment of the Blaylock residence. In a rare breach of protocol, Johnson suggested they conduct a seance led by Escobar. Within seconds of her entering a trance state, a loud rhythmic pounding was heard within the walls, and Escobar was possessed by an entity capable only of screaming. The circle was broken by Mr. Blaylock and the phenomena immediately ceased. Escobar suffered a complete nervous breakdown and fell into a state of catatonia. Pyramids arrived, and as they attempted to stabilize Escobar for transport, Dr. Johnson heard a faucet running in the master bath where he witnessed and photographed the full-body apparition of an adolescent female. Before he could further investigate, he was ordered by Mr. Blaylock to leave the house. Temp, 73 degrees, 72 degrees, 72 degrees, 73 degrees. I think I copied that. 73, 72, 73, 73. All right, hold it. We got 73, 72, 74, 76. No, I think we're goofing with you, man. <laughs> Hey, I get it to joke to you. Please take it a little more seriously. All right, man. You're, right. You're right. You're right. You're right. You're right. Sorry, I'm late. No problem. No problem. 
Um, wow. Yeah. Seems a lot smaller than I remember. Uh, what is your deal? You just snapped at me. What, what is the issue with you right now? I, her? What is her? What is your problem with her? Shut up. I was, you know, he's, he's here because Caltrans technically owns the house at this point. Blaylock is gone. He's out of the picture. Finally, you know, after years of like, pain in the ass. You look good. Thanks. Nice to meet you. Thank you. <laughs> wow, you feel good. Yeah. Okay, so let's let's um we can get settled later. What is the problem? Why do you not worry? She's a fucking nut job. I don't know what kind of shit she'd be doing with her. She'd be, she's not bringing a damn shit. You and your demonic crap. crap. I swear to okay. you. Just, you know, brush it off. Where is she? Where is she right now? I know, uh, so apparently. She's a medium that died for life a lot of times. Okay. And I believe it's what? because of everything went the way it did. I believe she had a lot to do with it. Okay. Which was bad stuff. Which could potentially happen again. You, you could call it that stuff. You could create all the great oh, stuff. Yeah. Oh, okay. We're trying it's to great. Well. Oh, it's great to be completely taken you over. Know, I'm so you know. tired of this shit. You've got such a stick up your ass. In the master bedroom and elevated EMF levels. So far, we've done pretty well. Do even better. At this point, we don't know what's going to happen. All we can do is hope. Signing off, Dr. Jeremy Johnson. <laughs>